Good afternoon to all who have joined online for the SLMA lecture in rehabilitation organized by the expert subcommittee in rehabilitation SLMA. The presentation would be on rehabilitation of traumatic brain injury and it will be delivered by Dr. Uditha Jayathunga, consultant in rehabilitation medicine. Uh, I mean, who had been a product from Peradaniya Medical Faculty and has been serving in UK for a very long period. Uditha needs no introduction for senior community who are with interest in rehabilitation in Sri Lanka. For the sake of the formality, let me tell you that he is the, he worked at, he is a consultant in rehabilitation medicine from 2001. Previously, he was at Leicester General Hospital and now the Associate Clinical Director in Rehabilitation Medicine at the Royal Derby Hospital. He served in the National Health Service in England in the Clinical Reference Group in Complex Disability. He has written more than 10 medical booklets on chronic long-standing medical conditions such as diabetes, stroke, epilepsy, etc., for the benefit of Sri Lankan patients. He's a committee member of the Sri Lanka Medical Dental Association in UK, and he introduced, as the committee member, he introduced sharing of professional expertise program to enable consultants from the UK to give talks across Sri Lanka. More recently, he was most useful for us when we were establishing the postgraduate training program uh, in, uh, in medical rehabilitation at the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine. He very voluntarily and willingly uh, consented to contribute to the development of the curriculum of the postgraduate medical program in medical rehabilitation. Medical rehabilitation was introduced as a subspecialty to our postgraduate training program only in the recent past. Udita is currently the secretary of Peradaniya Medical School Alumni Association. So Udita has been a very close friend of the medical fraternity here in Sri Lanka who are with interest in rehabilitation. I will remember that Udita and another friend of him visiting Sri Lanka and meeting postgraduate, the director PGIM in early 2000. And I mean, was uh, submitting a proposal to the PGIM for establishment of rehabilitation medicine uh, in Sri Lanka. So he uh, was with an interest to see that the rehabilitation medicine is developing in Sri Lanka and I'm glad that we could have him, Udita, as our very spe first speaker uh, in the programs uh, that we organized from the, uh, the expert subcommittee on medical rehabilitation of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. With that brief introduction, let me uh, invite Dr. Udita Jayatunga to make his presentation. Udita, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Padma, uh, for your kind introduction and greetings from the UK. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Udisa Sora, who has been helping me through this. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased that uh, I'm the uh, uh, Padma Bhunjatna uh, uh, during her presidency, we had a the one of the key topics we will be concentrating on. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, there are seven, around seven billion people in the world. And, and uh, as you uh, know, uh, most of the people these days use the internet. 
Uh, I want to start the talk with some interesting facts about the brain. And uh, so the information gathered around the world using the internet is enormous. But uh, if we uh, discuss the power of the brain, it is being dis uh, described as the most complex structure in the universe. And uh, it has uh, the, the, the capacity of the brain is for brilliant bite. And it is the same as the whole of the internet. Just imagine right now how many people across the world will be using the internet. Uh, individuals as well as companies or governments and our brain has got the capacity of all of the internet. Our brain is 30 times faster than the most powerful uh, computers, IBM Sequoia or uh, Japan's uh, K computer which took 40 minutes to crunch information and brain has taken only one second. Brain stores uh, information, about 150 trillion pieces of information throughout our lifetime. We, on the average, we have about uh, 49 thoughts a minute, which equates to about 70,000 thoughts a day. And overall, it is about five times more information than Encyclopedia Britannica. If you want to drain the brain of all its power, and if you compare it with the TV, you need to keep the TV running for over 300 years to drain all the all its power, just, just like a battery, if you want to drain the Brain, the power of the brain. And our brain is 500,000 more, times more powerful than a standard computer, but it uses only the power of 20 watt bud. So extreme efficiency. So how does this uh, why do we need all, all, all this uh, power uh, in the brain? Uh, when we take one step, we use 200 muscles. The brain controls 200 muscles. Uh, in rehabilitation, we do something called functional electrical stimulation, where during the gait cycle, we try to control one or two muscles to optimize gait, and we take that as a high-tech uh, system, but our brain automatically controls 200 muscles effortlessly when we take one step. When we grin, uh, it controls 47 muscles, and our eye muscles focus 100,000 times a day. Brain uses one third of our gene pool out of about uh, 20,500 genes. Brain is able to recognize 10 million colors, 100,000 tastes, 1 trillion odors, and is able to recognize sound between 20 and 20,000 hertz. So that is the power of the brain in a nutshell. So damaging this brain will have severe consequences. If we discuss the epidemiology of uh, traumatic brain injury, these are statistics from UK. About uh, 275 per 100,000 gets uh, admitted to hospital. You do have two people very young age and over 75 do the falls. And uh, out of these, most are mild, and about uh, 25 out of 100,000 
really moderate to severe. Uh, if you uh, consider the Sri Lankan population, this should be equivalent to about 5,000 patients of moderate to severe category. Uh, most of the patients uh, do have good physical recovery, which is different to many other types of brain related disability like finger palsy or stroke or, or tumors or whatever it is, uh, where they could have residual physical disability. But in general, most of the patients with the traumatic brain injury have good physical recovery, but their problems are cognitive in nature. And recovery could happen over a long period of time uh, due to new plasticity and neuro repair mechanisms as well as compensatory mechanisms. So if you look at TBI in Sri Lanka, I, I don't know whether you know that injuries are the number one cause of hospital admission in Sri Lanka. They, these are uh, these will be all types of injuries, not uh, from the brain injury per se, but injuries are the number one cause of hospital admission. Uh, about 1.3 million patients are admitted with injuries, and in uh, 2023, it's projected to go up to 1.5 million. Injury uh, trauma is the 10th cause of hospital death, which is around 1,900. And out of these, uh, 25% of patients who have had falls, road traffic accidents, 18%, and patients who have been hit or struck by objects, 22%. And it is very important to recognize that uh, about two thirds of patients are young patients between 16 to 40 years. And this is a very important fact. We are looking at very productive age group of uh, patients who are having uh, traumatic brain injury. Uh, there has been an audit at National Hospital in May uh, 2015. And uh, during that month, there had been 150 admissions. And uh, of course, majority of them had been male, as you see there, 83%. Uh, and 65% were between 18 and 60 years. Again, uh, younger age, uh, age group. Out of that, 65% were road traffic accidents, out of which uh, two thirds are motorbikes, and 27% uh, were tricycle accidents. Uh, about close to 50% were in the intensive care unit, and 39% had surgical intervention for their traumatic brain injury, and there were eleven percent deaths. My my particular concern is that the average length of stay was only seven days, and um, the range between two and twenty one days. Now, this sort of patient, particularly if uh, close to fifty percent were in the intensive care unit. Uh, and another 40% of patients who have had surgical intervention. These sort of patients in UK, we would be keeping them in hospital for over three months. So I, I just, I'm keen to know where did these patients go after that, or whether they were actually discharged from home from National Hospital Colombo. These are the broad categories of uh, Causes of TBI in UK, uh, most, most traffic accidents fall and struck uh, by, or uh, again, 20% assaults and uh, other minor forces. Now, if you look at the pathophysiology, primary mechanism of brain injury, there are four main. Uh, the injuries which could happen it could be due to direct focal trauma if they are hit by uh, 
something or bunch of wounds or whatever it is. Hoop and front of hoop injuries, which we know mainly uh, affecting uh, the frontal lobe and the occipital lobe. And therefore, we see lots of patients with frontal lobe problems. Diffuse axonal injuries, uh, injuries due to vascular damage as well as pituitary damage. As I have shown there, shows the uh, possible mechanism for pituitary damage. Uh, diffuse axonal injury is pretty important. Uh, and uh, this damage is predominantly microscopic. In the longitudinal structures, uh, nerves as, as well as axons are liable to get uh, uh, damage due to shear. And these are microscopic in na nature. And if there's a rotational element to the brain injury, so it that goes on for motorbikes. Uh, that if you, uh, you get more diffuse external injury. Uh, as you see, the, the uh, biopsy has shown uh, um, microscopic hemorrhages and, uh, and uh, the, the scans could be normal, uh, particularly the CT scan. So if you have a patient with that, uh, uh, traumatic brain injury coming to the hospital, and if you do a CT scan, you, and if it's normal, you must never say, oh, he, uh, the scan is normal, and therefore he's going to make a good recovery, because they could have performed damage due to diffuse axonal injury, which may not be detected on CT scan. But uh, certainly, uh, scans could show minor uh, bleeds scattered, and this is, uh, uh, these are the two little sexual injuries. So in a hospital setting, when they come into hospital, we at the, one of the main uh, emphasis will be to prevent any secondary damage. The primary damage has already happened. So these are the things in an IP type of setting, they will try to optimize uh, we, we had to remember that these patients don't come only with traumatic brain injury. Some patients have got polytrauma, and uh, therefore uh, controlling hypertension, controlling uh, intracranial uh, uh, pressure, the insoluble edema or hemorrhages, hypoxia, hypoglycemia, infection, hydrocephalus, electrolyte abnormality. These have to be controlled and optimized. Uh, in the acute state. When they come to uh, rehabilitation, some of them may have had a craniotomy or craniectomy or uh, VP shunts due to these uh, complications. If you look at classification, classification is mainly based on GCS, loss of consciousness and post-traumatic amnesia. This is between 13 and 15, will be mild, but the consciousness after 15 minutes and post-traumatic amnesia uh, up to six hours will be mild. And uh, this is of less than eight, uh, loss of consciousness up to 48 hours and post-traumatic amnesia over 24 hours and beyond will be severe and all the others will be moderate. But uh, though this is the classification, the severity of a brain injury is very difficult to predict purely based on that classification. Uh, so therefore, some patients with uh, mild head injuries could have severe ongoing problems, and some patients with uh, sort of moderate to severe injuries can make a good recovery. Uh, and, and again, it, de it depends how you define uh, good recovery because good physical recovery will be uh, different to uh, ongoing uh, problems with cognitive uh, and behavioral problems. Now, in a rehabilitation setting, 
as I think, particularly in moderate to severe grade injury, we will be concentrating on following aspects. So they should have paralysis, spasticity, ataxia, and coordination problems. They could have sensitivity, hyperesthesia, allergenia, hypothetia, continence problems, visual and uh, problems, hearing loss, speech, and communication problems, dysphagia and hypersalivation issues, seizures, and also multiple other symptoms like headache, fatigue, uh, fatigue dizziness, sleep disorders. And also, the, as I said, these patients don't come only with a traumatic brain injury. They, come, they have polytrauma, so we have to manage all the other uh, trauma-related issues. And uh, about 60% uh, of the traumatic brain injury patients are uh, the injuries are associated with alcohol and drug uh, issues. So we need to try and manage these issues. So from a rehabilitation perspective, these are the things which we will uh, look at. And therefore, the management of these patients are quite complex. Now, the uh, one while while being in the inpatient stay, and particularly once they are discharged from the uh, hospital setting, it is the cognitive problems which dominate their uh, the, the, the sequelae of. Uh, traumatic brain injury. And uh, there's a long list of cognitive problems. So problems with memory, attention, concentration, uh, perception, problem solving, insight, safety awareness, self-monitoring, social judgment. So, and, and this list continues. And uh, then behavioral and emotional problems, emotional liability, poor initiation and motivation, mood change, aggressiveness, disinhibition, inappropriate sexual behavior, psychosis, and depression. Some of these patients can become psychotic purely due to a traumatic brain injury. So this is a huge list. And invariably, many moderate to severe brain injury patients will have at least, at least up to about five of these uh, cognitive and behavioral problems, if not more. So in managing them, uh, managing aggression, uh, uh, agitation and irritability, we may try them on uh, beta blockers, which, uh, call, uh, which uh, causes a uh, limbic noradrenaline blockage. We may give uh, propanolol up to high doses of pindalol, sodium uh, valproate, again reduce to limbic irritability or uh, carbamazepine, we may use the thiopine, uh, which we may need to use in an acute stage, and this is uh, to support the dopa stimulation. Uh, Tricyclic SSRIs, uh, which causes fun the increased functional inhibition, uh, and metaphenidate. I personally haven't used metaphenidate, uh, benzodiazepines are also used, but uh, though there are no studies to indicate its effectiveness, but we do use benzodiazepines quite frequently. So the problem, ongoing problems are related to, as I mentioned, due to uh, cognitive and behavioral problems. And again, as I said, most of the patients do make a good physical recovery. So the spouses will say, yes, he is the man I married physically, but he's not the same person I married 
And over a period of time, this, particularly in the UK, this will lead to a lot of uh, family and marriage breakdowns because the spouses simply cannot uh, cope with the different personality of these faces. Now, these, uh, so this is a study uh, of challenging behaviors of traumatic brain injury. They have, so once the patient comes home, because of his behavior and, and uh, aggressiveness or, or, or changing personality, he will start losing his friends and he, uh, he will be unable to form new friendships. They, he could have poor initiation. So the spouses will pester them day in and day out to get washed and dressed sometimes. And this will again trigger aggression in, uh, in patients. They can't engage with community activities. So going to the shop, going to work, studying and leisure activities, they may not be able to manage on their own. They may not be able to regain their family role. And as I said, they may not be able to maintain their relationship. Uh, relationship. And on top of this, it's going to affect them financially. And these are some of the challenging behaviors of the brain injury which affect the family leading to ultimately, in some cases, breakdown of their relationship. If we look at, uh, at the uh, minor end uh, of brain injury, 80% of the patients uh, will become uh, symptom-free after about uh, six months, about, but about 20% will continue to have ongoing symptoms like headache, dizziness, fatigue, lack of concentration, impaired memory, irritability, mood changes, uh, and uh, emotional problems, mental and uh, impacting on vocational function. Uh, some patients could develop post concussion syndrome where these symptoms uh, go on for a longer period of time, gain similar spectrum of symptoms, weakness, dizziness, fatigue, depression, insomnia, anxiety, irritability, poor concentration, and headache. Though, uh, once again, uh, some of them will recover in six, uh, within six months. We do suggest rest and exercise. Uh, we, uh, our psychologists do help these patients, and we individual aspect of the symptoms like depression, uh, we may give uh, tricyclic for headache. Post-traumatic amnesia, uh, patients are conscious but they are disoriented and confused and this, uh, this is a marker of severity as I mentioned before, it could last for hours and in some cases it could last for, for weeks. And they do not have continuous day-to-day -day recall and uh, managing them in the acute phase is very difficult because they don't know why they're in hospital, what happened to them, they can't remember uh, who came to see them uh, the day before uh, and, and uh, they become irritable. Uh, and on top of that, they, as I said, most of the patients, they have uh, drug and alcohol issues uh, we have to grapple with uh, drug and alcohol withdrawal. We manage them in quiet environments. We avoid overstimulation and for aggressiveness, we try carbamazepine and well for it and drug drug therapy, as I mentioned before. Post traumatic headaches are extremely common, uh, up to about 90%, and uh, multiple. Uh, could be due to multiple causes. Uh, it could be a neuropeptide induced central pain, thalamocortical suppression, or uh, intracranial tissue damage causing neurosensitization. Uh, some patients do have chronic daily headache, 
um, the headache types are tension by the tension type of headache by like majority plus the headache or uh, migraine cervicogenic or neuropathic or sometimes it's a combination of these. Uh, occipital neuralgia is quite common uh, following uh, head and neck injuries and we need to look out for those. And uh, if there are tender uh, spots, you can uh, give uh, ibuprofen gel or uh, refer them for trigger point injection. Uh, headache is associated with post concussion syndrome, post traumatic stress disorder. Headache is also precipitated by all the other things due to traumatic brain injury like fatigue, dizziness, photo or phonophobia, diplopia, cognitive problems, or sleep issues. It is difficult to treat. We manage it with tricyclic, uh, or if it's between a type of headache and between prophylaxis. And we also provide behavioral support for them to uh, manage their headache. Fatigue, again, is, is very, very common. Uh, <clears throat> so it could be uh, mental fatigue, which could be due to cognitive problems, sensory overload, they can't multitask, they can't. Uh, be in an environment where there are so many uh, so many sensory inputs, uh, maybe a noisy environment or in, in busy environment, their fatigue will increase. And uh, the episodes of fatigue could uh, appear suddenly. Uh, it also can lead to memory and concentration issues, fearfulness, slow thinking, instability, stress, sleep problems, and also headache. Information processing is significantly uh, reduced. Uh, it is thought that fatigue is due to astrocyte dysfunction and uh, Astrocytes are involved in uh, glutamate metabolism in, in the synapses. And when it's uh, so due to astrocyte uh, dysfunction, it can affect uh, the nerve impulses. Um, and uh, for some patients, fatigue could be the dominant issue in their. Uh, lifestyle. Sleep disorders again common, uh, difficulty in sleeping, uh, disordered, uh, disordered sleep, hypersomnia, which could be due to thalamic or hypothalamic dysfunction. They could have circadian sleep rhythm problems. They could have REM sleep behavior disorder where they act their dreams and can even become violent in their sleep. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder can once again affect their sleep. Uh, where, due to poor sleep, that will contribute to cognitive problems, irritability, and also uh, it can contribute to depression, anxiety, and fatigue. Of course, when you are, when you are sleep deprived, again, that, that will cause an additional layer of fatigue. Or obstructive, they can develop obstructive sleep apnea. And also, we need to remember that some of the traumatic brain injuries may have been due to sleep problems itself, people falling asleep while driving. So, we need to recognize that fact also, even before the traumatic brain injury some patients would have had sleep problems causing their brain injury. Dizziness, again, very common. It could be central or peripheral, uh, predominantly peripheral uh, due to uh, the effect uh, of the brain injury on the vestibular system, particularly semicircular canal dysfunction and also with uh, uh, dislodgement. 
uh, they could have uh, abnormal vestibular ocular reflux, uh, which tends to arise from uh, a semicircular canal. Uh, they could uh, complain of vertigo, light headedness, unsteadiness, or free syncope sometimes. Uh, traumatic brain injury is a common cause of benign personal vertigo. They could have motion sensitivity, uh, dizziness. Once again, again, it, it can contribute to headache, uh, unsteadiness, difficult uh, in concentration, blurriness, and nausea. Some patients will uh, recover spontaneously with time with mild patients with uh, having uh, abnormal vestibular ocular reflex, they are given graded uh, activities to do. And uh, for more severe cases, uh, they are given uh, vestibular ocular reflex blood patient exercises through specialist clinic. Seizures are uh, within first week, you can have up to about 4% up to the first week, up to about 30%. High incidence of early seizures uh, and, and uh, the high incidence of, of seizures could be due to uh, the principal factors, frontal and temporal lobe injury, as well as uh, subdural uh, hemorrhages. Uh, anti epileptics are given in the first week for prevention of early seizures, and you have to treat recurrences. Uh, if recurrences happen, we have to treat them with appropriate anti epileptics. Visual problems are again common. 90, once again, very common, 90% could ha uh, have uh, visual problems. They can complain of blurry vision, which could be convergence insufficiency. Light sensitivity is common in about 50%. Uh, uh, particularly, they can't tolerate blue, uh, blue color. Uh, these could lead to reading difficulty. Uh, once again, can contribute to headache uh, because uh, they can't uh, focus properly. Uh, I did say that all the longitudinal structures are liable to get damaged, including the uh, cranial nerves. So they can get diplopia and we give them prison to correct that. Peripheral visual field defects are less common than in stroke. They could have reduced depth perception and they will struggle to walk uh, and identify the surface because of this. And also, uh, visual cognition could be affected. They may not be able to uh, recognize the things they have seen, recognize the people, uh, people's faces. In fact, right now I have got a patient who is unable to remember her husband. She can remember everyone else, but she cannot remember her husband. So you can have really uh, uh, specific problems uh, like that uh, due to uh, the injury. Hypopituitarism is again, uh, is well known. It can, it can cause fatigue, lethargy, general weakness, low mood, poor motivation, difficulty in concentration. Reduce appetite, unexplained weight loss or weight gain, uh, dizziness. So, if patients have some of these, you need to think of hypothetical uh, uh, Male patients could have sexual dysfunction or reduce saving frequency. Females could have oligomania or amenorrhea or reduce axillary or uh, pubic hair. So in a mild uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, hypopituitism is reported in about 17%, moderate 11%, and severe up to 35%. Those 
most hormone deficiency is, is uh, most common. Uh, and in MRI scans of patients having had moderate to severe brain injury, 30% have shown focal changes. Long term, uh, in the longer term, uh, loss of volume in the pituitary and patella syndrome, abnormal or abnormal enhancement of the pituitary or profession deficit. And some patients, sometimes they carry in the longer term whether they could have even have autoimmune pituitary dysfunction. They have found that in boxes, uh, up to 46% have got pituitary dysfunction. Uh, in the acute stage, we, uh, we may need to uh, uh, check their cortisol levels. They could have diabetes insipidus and SIADH, uh, hyperactive due to SIADH. We do pituitary uh, function test at three months uh, as listed below, uh, just to see whether they could be having underlying hyperactivity. Uh, so coming back to uh, rehabilitation, we concentrate on motor function and control. We uh, look at uh, uh, management of facility and person. We give support if CT, age, and various types of drinking. Uh, functional input stimulation is uh, something which we do particularly for passive food drugs. For patients who have got visual problems, we do refer them to ophthalmology or orthoptic who may give them uh, kissings. Uh, if they have got hearing problems, we do refer them to audiologists for hearing. Uh, sometimes they act with hearing aids. And uh, we manage visual neglect. If they have got speech problems, we may give them communication aids. For swallowing problems, we will uh, we may uh, get video fluoroscopy done, uh, put them on an NG tube, or uh, sometimes in more severe cases, uh, insert head tube for feeding. If they have cognitive problems, uh, all uh, neuro rehab units and brain injury units. We are heavily dependent on neuropsychologists. So, uh, our neuropsychologists do assessment of their cognitive uh, function and uh, help us with their cognitive rehabilitation. If they have got emotional problems, we do antidepressants. And if they have got severe behavioral problems, we do one to one supervision and uh, we get our psychologists uh, involved in management. And we also need to support uh, the summons. If they have got psych uh, psychiatric uh, issues, we need to see whether they have had preceding mental health problems. We need, as I said, we need to tackle alcohol and drug uh, abuse. Uh, we may give, uh, we may assess the activities of daily living and give them equipment and various adaptations for them to manage their life at home. Driving is paramount uh, in, in UK, getting back to driving and it's very, very strict. We have to produce all patients who have had a traumatic brain injury uh, or particularly uh, moderate severe brain injury. They have to report to our driving agency and uh, and they go to formal assessment process uh, for them to uh, get back to driving. Uh, it, is, it is a very, very uh, serious issue in UK. And uh, most of these patients are young patients and they want to get back to uh, work or get back to their education. So we need to support them uh, with those. And uh, for Coming on to uh, getting back to work, I just want to give an example of the patient. Uh, as most of the patients are young patients, they, they will ultimately want to get back to work. And this is something which we as doctors we need to say. So how do we assess? 
whether they are ready to go back to work. If they go back to work early, uh, invariably they will, they will not be able to cope because of all the cognitive problems. So how do we assess them whether they are ready to go back to work? As they are physically all right, uh, there will be lots of pressure for uh, the spouses, family, as well as for uh, financial reasons to go back to work in safety. So this is an example of a, a, a typical example of a neuropsychological report on a patient uh, who wanted to go back to work. So 35-year-old executive with traumatic brain injury because all the subject activity. He has got moderate perceptual impairment. So he will get disoriented, he may get lost. Reduced verbal memory processing. He'll miss part of the conversation. Severe impairment of visual memory. He miss misplaced things. Moderate impairment of executive function. He can't plan things or problem solve. Impairment of cognitive and motor processing. He needs much more time to do things. He Difficult multitasking can concentrate only on one activity. Poor attention span needs prompt and break. Mental fatigue needs pacing. So this, as you see, with this report, you will obviously know that this chap cannot go back to work as he is now. And unless you do a formal neuropsychological assessment, it will we will not be able to identify these specificities, which is very important. We as we have research are unable to do that in this sort of detail. So we are heavily dependent on our neuropsychologists. So they do language uh, assessments, uh, perception, uh, like non-verbal reason, information processing, scanning, uh, scanning and uh, speed. Um, motor speed, attention and concentration uh, assessment, like dual tasking, sustained attention, memory, visual, uh, auditory and verbal memory, and uh, executive functions like problem solving and flexibility. In the longer term, following a uh, moderate or severe brain injury from 38 uh, study, which has shown uh, only about 35 get back to work within one year and within five years, 50%. And only, even if they go back to work, only one third return to their pre-employment level of work. So that is very important. Even if 50% go back to work, out of that only one third will uh, will be able to get back to the pre-employment level of work. I just want to mention briefly on vegetative state, uh, where they have got sleep break cycles, uh, they may have reflex movements, uh, they may have spontaneous movements, we do a sensory stimulation program for them. Uh, if they are in the state for one year, uh, they are uh, labeled as having permanent uh, in permanent vegetative state. The next stage in their recurrent process, they move from vegetative state to minimally conscious state. So, in the management of brain injury in acute wards, you will look at you may look at only the physical uh, difficulties. Oh, this chap has had a brain injury. He has done very well physically, so will discharge him. And that's probably what is happening mostly in Sri Lanka. But I think if you forget that they have got all these other problems, memory problems, emotional problems, sensory problems, ADL problems, fatigue, hormone problems, cognitive problems, uh, problems with new learning, uh, epilepsy and inoperative behavior. If you forget all those, you are not doing justice to them. And um, so it is very important to see that uh, managing brain injury is very complex. And if I just take a clinical scenario, uh, 35 old company executive married, uh, father of two children, hit by a car while crossing the road, which is quite common, has got a moderate head injury. He has had initial neurosurgical intervention, 
and his clinical problems are moderate hemiplegia, octomiplegia, facility, continence, behavior, and uh, cognitive problems. Now, what will happen without rehab input? He will uh, have neurosurgery and he will regain some mobility. He will be discharged within about two weeks' time. <laughs> he has ongoing problems with spasticity, mobility problems, diplopia, urinary frequency, and depression. And he's un unable to cope at home. He will have significant cognitive and behavioral problems, and he will not know who can help him because there are no brain injury services. He will try to go back to work, but cannot cope. He will be labeled as psychiatric patient. Family in chaos, there's no income. He's dissociated socially. Two years later, he, he may end up in a divorce and he, the rest of his life, he will live in misery and depression. So that's what could happen without rehabilitation. Now, if we go back to see what could happen with rehabilitation, he will be transferred to a head injury rehabilitation unit. He will have MDT input. He will be referred to the ophthalmology services. His continent and facet could be managed. He will have a neuropsychological assessment. And specific cognitive issues will be identified. He will be discharged home after about two months with help, advice, and support. Specific cognitive issues identified could be discussed with employees and we, we can plan a phase return. He will continue to have outpatient follow up to the PBI uh, team. Uh, medical therapy optimized, ongoing neuropsychology support, and he will get back to driving and lead a normal life. So that is the difference we have can do for patients. So in UK, the, uh, the, uh, the, the pathway for these patients, they come to acute trauma units and acute hospital intensive care unit. Then from there, they will step down to medical orthopedic or surgical ward or directly to a new rehab ward where they could be there up to about three months. Uh, and we follow them up for many years, up to three years to uh, support them with their uh, cognitive and behavioral problems. Some of the very severe patients will end up in nursing home and uh, we also have a great therapy. So my final slide is that uh, I started by saying that uh, the brain, uh, brain is the most complex structure in the universe. Right, so if you look at our, our other body system, for heart, we have got cardiology. For lungs, respiratory medicine, kidneys, we have got renal unit, gut, gastro, gastro unit, skin, dermatology unit, bones, orthopedic unit, and now a, a system neurology unit. Uh, none of our patients go through any uh, a neurology ward or neurology because it's not a diagnostic problem, it's a managing problem. It's a problem of management of chronic brain injury. So, for traumatic brain injury, we need neuro rehab units as well as traumatic brain injury service. So, I hope the specialty of rehabilitation is quite new, and the first trainees are going through their training. And I hope we can rectify this anomaly and provide. Uh, better service to traumatic brain injury patients in Sri Lanka. I was going to show a uh, short, short YouTube clip, but I don't think I have got time. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm quite happy to take any questions if you have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Udita Jayatunga, for that very comprehensive talk. And I'm sure we learned a lot of things about traumatic brain injury. Uh, there was one question uh, from the audience. Uh, that was, uh, if uh, a patient with traumatic brain injury having a prolonged conscious uh, issue, consciousness issues, 
what is your approach to that patient? So we need to see whether they are in a coma or vegetative state or minimally conscious state. So uh, many patients go through from coma to vegetative state to minimally conscious state and we support them. Uh, patients who are in, so they move on to a vegetative state after about a, a month in general. And then we, if they are in vegetative state, we do a lot of uh, uh, assessments and sensory stimulation and see whether they, they, they progress to minimally conscious state. And we support them throughout their uh, uh, process. And, 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 and in fact, uh, we do have specialist units, units for patients uh, to treat uh, patients who have uh, uh, patients who are in vegetative state or minimally conscious state, they, they could treat the patient up to one year. I have a question with regard to pediatric patients. I don't know whether if you have any experience with pediatric traumatic brain injury uh, in your practice. We, we, in our unit, we do get patients 16 and over. Uh, in UK, uh, the number of units uh, providing pediatric brain injury units are very small in number. Yeah. Uh, uh, I live in Derby and there is a pediatric brain injury unit in Birmingham. So there are very few in number. Okay. Uh, just one more question from me. Uh, you said that uh, that uh, within the first week of the traumatic brain injury, that uh, the anti-epileptics will be prescribed uh, as a uh, prophylaxis. Uh, is that the case? Is that, or did I understand it wrong? Yeah. So it is. Uh, uh, of course, when the patients come to our ward, they are at least two weeks down the line, and sometimes even one month down the line. So in the acute stage, of course, they are in, in uh, intensive care or neurosurgically. So as a routine, they start anti-epileptic uh, medication to prevent early seizure. And the recommendation is that it should be stopped after a week if they don't uh, have seizures. Or even if they have seizures in the first one or two days, that could be stopped we, uh, uh, within the first week. And if they get recurrent, uh, then uh, we treat uh, them as well. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 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 I am a neurosurgeon. Uh, okay. I, I agree that there is no rehabilitation program for head injury patient in this country. Yeah. As, uh, mainly because of the number of patients. We do get about 20, 30 cases per day. And out of that, uh, six to seven severe injuries. But that's not the concern. But our concern is mainly about mild and moderate cases. Yes, we do discharge in two, three days because of the problems of the... Uh, we, since we do not have uh, rehabilitation facilities, there's no other option. Either we'll have to send them home if the GCS of 15, or else them send them back to the local hospital for the rest of the care. So that is the main issue with, with us. And the rehabilitation person comes and see us, see us only once a week. So we can't keep stag on the patients till we get the care. And it is a pathetic situation. We try to overcome this thing, but still we are in a we are far away from the Western world in the, this uh, long-term management. Though we are up to the mark with the management of the primary or secondary brain injuries with the ICP monitors, ICUs, variable, all these things are there, but still that is the case in this country. Yeah, I think, I think that's why I highlighted those uh, numbers uh, at the beginning. I, I was concerned that these cases stay only for about a week the average, whereas we keep them for months and months. And it is because I think uh, 
uh, by and large uh, uh, you, beyond the acute state, their problems are ongoing problems due to brain injury are not recognized and they get lost to the system. They don't know where to go, who can uh, help them. And some of them could be in severe uh, misery. The, uh, yeah. uh, Udita, the, uh, thank you very much for that uh, very comprehensive presentation. Uh, I see that uh, we, I mean, there is a sort of a fairly wide range uh, of uh, uh, professionals who have got joined uh, for your presentation. I see neurosurgeons, uh, our rheumatologists, the physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, sort of it is from a very broad range of uh, specialties who have joined here. The, uh, as uh, Dr. Vadanambi uh, highlighted, that uh, the, uh, the traumatic brain injury rehabilitation uh, is not that much established here in Sri Lanka, and that's why exactly uh, why we uh, established this uh, expert committee for rehabilitation here from the SLMA, and then SLMA has a uh, expert committee for uh, road traffic, uh, I mean, the prevention of road traffic injuries uh, subcommittee as well. So because, uh, as such that I'm little in touch with this uh, uh, road traffic accidents on these days. The, uh, now here in Sri Lanka, the accident rate is about, uh, now if you get uh, a death, 2.7% of deaths here in Sri Lanka are caused by road traffic accidents. And then uh, about another 8,000 per year are left with severe injuries. It's not minor injuries, severe traumatic injuries. Do you have any knowledge uh, with regard to these figures in UK? Yeah, so, so that's why we have got about 25 per 100,000 uh, moderate to uh, severe patients uh, with traumatic brain injury. And, and uh, because uh, neuro rehab units are instead are there in all, all major hospitals, they, they are kind of true to uh, neuro rehab units. And, and after this, uh, particularly our hospital has got an outpatient traumatic brain injury service to provide them ongoing support. As I said, it's not only the inpatient uh, issues, but there, there are lots of other ongoing issues which they need support. And, and uh, yes, I joined the EO uh, uh, road traffic accident uh, program of, uh, last weekend. And uh, yeah, the numbers are high. And uh, unfortunately, these, uh, uh, if 2.7% uh, of people who live road traffic uh, die, there are so many uh, higher numbers who survive and live with severe consequences and they do need ongoing services. So I hope when uh, the, the trainees, new trainees in rehabilitation medicine, they, they come back, hopefully they will be able to establish some services to uh, provide a better service to uh, these patients. Uh -huh. Saraji, uh, uh, are there any other questions? Do you think that we should uh, find up? Uh, no, madam. No question. No more questions from the audience, madam. Right. So uh, uh, thank you, Dita. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I think that our the very first uh, uh, presentation talk for the rehabilitation, uh, uh, medical rehabilitation, was extremely successful. We had a sort of wide uh, range of uh, professionals uh, who joined online to uh, listen to your talk. And I think that that itself uh, would have created so much of interest among the professionals who are uh, with interest in developing rehabilitation medicine in Sri Lanka. Uh, there are many shortcomings uh, uh, in the system uh, when providing services, but then uh, uh, I mean, our knowledge on what is happening in developed countries is important for us to move forward. So in that sense, that I think that Udita's talk was so comprehensive and uh, so useful for us, I mean, who are planning 
and uh, uh, who are with uh, interest in developing uh, uh, stroke rehabilitation uh, in the country. Uh, so let me thank uh, Udita again for this excellent presentation. Uh, and uh, I, I thank all others uh, who join online for this presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you.